welcome everybody to Paleo Talks. We are at episode 22. Um, time is really flying by as we continue to do these episodes, uh, mostly from our homes in different places across the country and in, uh, even in other countries as well. This week, we're really excited to have back Dr. Larissa DeSantis, who was on one of our early episodes. Hey, Larissa. Hey, thanks for having me. You bet, you bet. David, I'm noticing we are having a little bit of a lag. Maybe that'll take care of itself after our cameras go off. Um, so today's topic, uh, Larissa last time talked about, I think, Rancho La Brea and the tar pits and some of the paleoecology. This week is, is different. We're actually going to be traveling to Australia and looking at some of her major research down there. Larissa is an associate professor at Vanderbilt University. And in just a minute, I'll have her introduce herself in a little bit more detail. David, if you wouldn't mind just again going over how the program works for everybody out there. Sure thing. Same format as usual. We're going to start off by having our guests go through their presentation, their research, uh, with Blaine uh, participating along the way. And then about 30 minutes in, about halfway, we're going to uh, bring that presentation to a close and start getting questions from the audience. So at that point, if you have questions, you can leave them in the comments of the Facebook video. And as usual, if for whatever reason you can't leave comments on Facebook, you can go over to the Gray Fossil Site Twitter account or Instagram and send us, uh, leave your questions as comments there. And I'll be keeping track of all of them and we'll get through as many as we can. All right, thank you, David. Uh, just a reminder that we're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University, where we have the gray fossil site. And yeah, this, uh, this episode that we're gonna be doing today with Australia is, is quite, quite different than the Australian fauna. But I do wanna mention that uh, Larissa was one of our first co-researchers on the gray fossil site and looking at paleoecology and tapirs and, and so she's been a longtime colleague and is right here in Tennessee. So very excited to have her. Uh, Larissa, great again to have you on here. Let's go ahead and share your screen and have you go ahead and just start introducing yourself, talk a little bit about how you got into paleontology and what led you down this path of research. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me just Perfect, here we go. Um, so today I'll be talking about sort of Australia and the title of the talk is I Diprotodon in the Coal Mine, um, Conservation Lessons from Australian Fossils. And this really comes from sort of this, you know, uh, basically coal mine bring canaries down into the coal mine. And if the canaries uh, essentially died or stopped tweeting, um, this would uh, give the miner some indication that there are problems in Australia. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about Australia and some of these things, but I did want to uh, introduce myself and Blaine had mentioned that this was a new thing and he, he wanted the speakers to kind of mention their journey. And so I did the natural thing and made a crazy slide um, that describes my journey. Uh, let's if I can go to, there we go. So this is a slide that really captures um, my path. Um, I started over here in Los Angeles. I was uh, originally from Los Angeles and I grew up going to the tar pits, but I also grew up going to the Natural History Museum. And I really do credit the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles um, with sort of exciting um, or sort of stimulating my interest in science from an early age. I took science camps. I remember taking one on robots, uh, one on snakes. Uh, there was a little kid that was bit in that class and I still remember it to this day. Um, I took a class on dinosaurs and, um, and also one on electricity. And so these were sort of part of my summertime routine and, and really I think got me fascinated in science. And I will say I've been really grateful to the LA Museum um, for the fact that they keep these programs going and even this past um, um, some of my own kids were able to partake in uh, their camps virtually um, and they've also partaken or they've also participated in these camps in person. So I really do um, credit these sort of these 
museums and science programs are absolutely important um, to getting kids interested. But long story short, um, I headed off to the University of Chicago to actually be a political science major. And I was really interested in going to you know, law school or going into politics. Um, I'm, I'm sort of glad that I take that, that path, but essentially randomly fell into paleontology. Um, I just happened to, you know, pass by a course and someone said to me, hey, there's this paleobiology course, um, you want to check it out with me? And, and I, you know, at, at University of Chicago, you have to take a whole biology sequence. And so I took an ecology evolution class in the fall and I really liked it. I took a physiology class in the, the winter and I also liked that as well. But my last sequence was a sort of immunology class. And uh, nothing against the topic, but the the professor wasn't um, particularly exciting. There wasn't a textbook. I knew it was going to be a struggle. And, you know, this friend invited me to check out this other course. And within the first five minutes, I was hooked. All of the, the sort of evolutionary theory was very similar to the sort of political theory that I really liked. Um, but it had, you know, all of the science in there as well. And so within a week after, you know, just sitting in on that class, I was actually starting volunteer in the prep lab and I worked on um, uh, super croc and also uh, sucomimus. In fact, I've, I've uh, liked going back to the Children's Museum in Chicago and finding the, the decrepit rib that I helped put together in the pelvis and things. It's, all, it's really fun to find the bones that I had worked on, but it really got me fascinated and, and got me to have the bug. Uh, from there, I went to UC Berkeley and finished my undergraduate degree. I transferred um, and also sort of walked in, started fossils and it was there that I I got to go out in the field for my the, my first time um, and look for fossils and also got connected with the graduate students and all the programs that were at Berkeley um, I really pushed back against doing paleontology as a career because it is a challenging one there are not that many jobs um, and I was also majoring in resource management so I was um, taking all these sort of conservation courses and land management courses and also paleo courses Courses. And, and at the time, I felt like I had to pick between um, sort of my passion for conserving or managing the land and my passion for the ancient land. Um, and at the time, these two things weren't really connected. They were two very different fields and two very different careers. So I went off to um, Yale's forestry school over here um, and I you know, did sort of the, took the coursework in, in land management, but I also took a lot of coursework in, in global climate change and also evolutionary um, sort of theory as well, and really tried to um, think about what I wanted to do in the future. And I also got really involved with education and outreach and um, worked for the Peabody Museum, which is, there's a picture of here, as working with teachers and um, working with them to, you know, design curriculum that was a, um, based on um, natural specimens. So that was really fun. So at this point, I'm completely confused. I, I like the land management, I miss the paleo, I like the education. So I thought, well, maybe education is, is for me. And so then I really took, uh, I think being young um, and, and feeling um, adventurous, really, I, I took that to its full extent. And this is the Winnebago, the 38 foot Winnebago um, that I used to drive in New York City to different schools throughout the, the five boroughs. Um, and this was not that long after 9-11. And so it was really important to bring um, actual exhibits to the schools. And there are actual fossil exhibits inside of here. We open this door and there's another door and the students would come in and actually um, you know, do different activities. And we would also do teacher workshops um, with the teacher. So they would have different curriculum that they would build in. So by the time they came to the exhibit, they already had some knowledge and we would work with them. So an absolutely fascinating job. And I, I do think I resemble Miss Frizzle a little bit. And so I, I, I like to think that I, I fully <laughs> took advantage of that um, and did the education. And it was fantastic. And I loved it. One of the best jobs I've ever had. It was with the American Museum of Natural History but I miss the paleo, I miss the research and everything just miraculously kind of came together. Um, someone I wanted to work with, which was Bruce McFadden, um, he you know, used isotopes to understand paleocology. Um, he was actually looking for someone who could look at how forests had changed over time 
here I was having this, you know, extensive background in conservation and forestry and forest management, but also in forest ecology, was passionate about sort of the paleo ecology side of things. Um, but he was also really supportive and engaged in broader impacts and education outreach. And so I was able to go to the University of Florida, um, do my PhD, stay involved with outreach and education, but also merge my two areas of interest, sort of this uh, conservation and ecology with paleontology. And fortunately for me, the fields have really come together in the last uh, decade, especially, and it sort of formed this new field called conservation paleobiology. And long story short, after that, I um, landed a position at Vanderbilt. And since I've been at Vanderbilt, I've been able to return um, and explore uh, other places. Although my first trip to Australia, what actually got me going there and starting to do research was actually a program I did as a graduate student through the National Science Foundation. Um, and it allows graduate students to work in labs in, um, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, China, Japan, um, uh, multiple countries um, in, the, in this region um, and connects people um, between these different labs. And I felt that was really useful. And after going one time, I've since been back numerous times and it's a major area of my research now. So that's my story. And, right. and, if, and I have even some more video clips and things on a more personal note of, you know, some of the, the highs and the lows also being a woman in science over the years. And so if you go to my website, uh, I put the link up top, you can kind of see a little bit more of a personal story. Um, and, and I guess one thing I'll mention is that, you know, what motivated me to do political science initially was actually um, when I was a kid, I had epilepsy. And so I advocated for the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that was what got me on that trajectory. Um, and then recently I've sort of um, re-mentioned this, this history, which was something I kind of kept private for a long time, but I think it's important to mention for any kids who, who have any challenges right now or any, whether it's a, a learning disability, whether it's a physical disability, um, that you know, these are all things you can kind of work through and there's a lot that you can do, even with paleontology. Thank you, Larissa, for sharing that, that thorough uh, you know, trip, that background, because I think for so many students out there, you know, they wonder about the path. How, how do you get to this point? And there are some paleontologists, I'd say actually quite a few paleontologists, that know that that's what they want to be from a very young age. I wasn't one of those either, and I took you know, quite a journey to get to that point. But I think one of the things that that does is all of your life experiences can ultimately help you in what your job ends up being as a paleontologist if that's the route you go and your background ended up being you know perfect for that subfield that you're now fitting into so it's wonderful to hear that and i still can't believe that you drove that winnebago around in the city that's crazy yeah neither neither can i when i go back and drive in New York city. <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's get started going through australia Great. So real quick to give you a little bit more of sort of a background on what we do in our lab. Um, we have a lab which is called the, uh, the DREAM Lab, um, which stands for Dietary Reconstructions and Ecological Assessments of Mammals. And these are the places I like to work. So as I mentioned, Australia is a big area of our research. So our places in North America, like the Librea Tar Pits, we work quite a bit in places like Florida, Texas, and also Alaska. But we also collaborate with folks pretty much all across the globe, um, minus Antarctica, on various questions. Um, before we can even study any of the fossils, we actually have to study a lot of modern animals. So all of the methods that we use, things like isotopes and microware, we have to make sure that these work um, on modern animals before we can actually apply them to the fossils. And so I like to think that I do uh, integrative paleoecology, which is essentially bringing lots of different tools and techniques to interpreting the ecology of an animal. So not just relying on their morphology, which can tell us quite a bit of information, um, but also looking at what they were actually eating using things like microware or stable isotopes to reconstruct their ecology. So this just gives a sense of some of the work coming out of our lab, but you can see that some of the big themes are ecology, Pleistocene, dietary, dental, um, and tools like stable isotopes and microware. 
And so a lot of people ask, why diet? Why do you, you know, your lab is the dream lab, dietary reconstructions. Why does it matter, you know, what an animal eats? And diet is such a fundamental part of what an animal does and how they live on a landscape. So for example, the koala, um, it is tied to eucalyptus trees. Um, it eats nearly exclusively eucalyptus. If there are no eucalyptus trees, there are no koalas. And so what this animal eats um, depend, it therefore dictates where this animal lives, right? So um, without the trees, uh, without that food source, you don't have that animal living there. Um, it can also influence sort of how an animal moves and, and their biomechanics. So cheetahs or, or lions are gonna take down prey in different ways. Um, and what their animal, the animals are that they're eating the prey is gonna dictate sort of how they move and, and physically run or um, move across that landscape. We can also see things like wildebeest. Um, their diet affects migration. So movement across geographic scales. Um, further, even uh, diet can affect sort of uh, reproduction um, in a variety of different animals. So it's really critical to the, the sort of lifestyle and niche and existence of animals. So the main questions that our lab is interested in is how have forested environments influence mammalian ecology and evolution? And as I mentioned, this was sort of um, work I did earlier as a graduate student, but now we're kind of returning to this question now in Australia and looking at how sort of the decline in forests has affected the ecology and evolution of mammals there. Most of the work that we do focuses on how has climate change affected mammalian communities and their floral environments. And that's what I'll be talking about today in Australia. Um, but we are also constantly asking answering how can we improve our understanding of the paleoecology and paleobiology of mammals by using different tools and techniques, different proxies. So real quick, why paleontology? Um, why does it matter that we study fossils? And, you know, coming from an, a sort of an ecological perspective as well, you know, ecology is critical. Conservation biology, these are, these are absolutely necessary disciplines. Um, but there are some downsides. So if I want to study this jaguar, um, I'm going to have to go out to this particular location, the particular area, monitor this population. Maybe I'll do it for a few years, five years, maybe 10 years if I get 10 years of funding. And maybe we can even set up a long-term ecological research station and generate data for 100 years. Not me personally, but series of students coming in. So we can interpret you know, how this animal is responding to these particular changes over a decade or maybe even a century. But in the fossil record, we're not limited by time. We can actually go back you know, thousands of years, millions of years, and ask both similar but also unique questions using the fossil record to extend that time axis. So fossils are really important. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, if you can guess what museum this is, uh, you get a gold star. Um, but you can see they're so important. We collect everything. So we collect them in the field, we, we curate them. They're really important. And I'm gonna stress why they're so important in this talk. So the tools that we use are things like microware and isotopes. And microware is essentially getting at sort of the scratchiness and the pittedness of these different surfaces. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. The isotopes are getting at sort of the um, chemical composition of the plants that they're eating. Are they eating things like C4 plants that conduct photosynthesis using a, um, certain pathways or C3 photosynthesis? And these things typically break down along the lines of C3 plants are largely trees and shrubs and C4 plants are largely sort of warm season grasses in places like Florida, but it gets very complicated in Australia and I'll mention why that is. So microware um, has come a long way. So it used to be that you would have to sit and sort of count these scratches uh, and pits. And I don't think I would have gotten into microware if that's what I had to do. Um, and I actually came into microware through working in Australia and out of pure necessity. Um, we can quantify it in three dimensions. Um, so we actually look at the directionality of the different surfaces. So if they're oriented in a, a similar direction, you have high anisotropy. And we tend to see this in things that are eating lots of grass or foliverous. Um, so uh, grazing kangaroos, grazing bovids, 
or a sloss. Uh, you can even see it in um, pandas eating lots of tough bamboo or cheetahs eating tough flesh. Complexity is um, sort of the pittedness of the surface. But what it sort of does is it's sort of like looking at the earth from outer space. Um, it looks really, really smooth. And as you get closer and closer into the earth, that surface gets more and more complex. And so we know that relationship is always going to exist, but we can actually quantify that relationship and look at the slope of that relationship. And that's what complexity essentially is. And what we find is that um, animals that are eating harder things, so hyena scavenging or um, you know, tapers, eating uh, more fruits with harder um, seeds like palm seeds, or armadillos eating lots of um, insects that you tend to have more complex surfaces. So isotopes, essentially you are what you eat. Everything you eat is in into your tissues. And that's true for just what you're eating today. Um, so everything you, you eat is incorporated um, at different time scales. Um, the nice thing about teeth is it sort of locks in um, that sort of dietary signal at the moment of time that that enamel is being laid down. Um, and, it, and it doesn't change. Unlike things like your blood, your breath, all of that is going to change constantly depending on the new meals you're consuming. And so we can use this to actually interpret what the animals were eating. Um, and typically we can say an animal was eating sort of C3 trees and shrubs or C4 grasses. Um, but in Australia, it's much more complicated. You also have C3 grasses and you have C4 shrubs. Um, the other thing that's really useful though, is you can tell sort of density within a forest, if it's sort of a, a denser, more closed forest or more open woodland. Um, and you can also tell that just with the isotopes themselves, I'm sort of in the C3 range. Oxygen isotopes. So what you drink is also incorporated into your tissues. Um, and what we know is that in areas that are more humid, um, you tend to have lower delta 18 values, but when it gets really dry and you have increased evaporation, it's easier for lighter isotopes um, to evaporate. And so it leaves behind more of the heavier isotopes and essentially that do a higher uh, delta 18 O value um, in really dry regions. And so this is perfect for Australia and I'll show you why it works so well in kangaroos. So what I have really been interested in for a long time is what are the effects of aridification in Australia, both past and present. Australia really is our canary in the coal mine. Um, there are a lot of similarities between much of Australia and places out west. And there is a lot that we can learn from Australia and their history over you know, centuries to thousands of years to even millions of years. So to kind of get you started, uh, my first sort of um, adventure into working in Australian paleontology um, was looking at the megafaunal extinction debate um, and to assess whether climate change potentially played a role in um, sort of, or was a potential of the extinction of lots of large animals in Australia um, at a particular period of time. And so what we find is that there's some different ideas about megafaunal extinctions. One is human overkill. And that's the idea that humans came onto the landscape, killed megafauna really, really quickly within a few, you know, a thousand years, 2000 years. Um, there's also other iterations of human overkill. Humans came over, killed megafauna, but it was a much more prolonged period of time. There's idea of human modification. So um, humans came over and alter the landscape by burning, um, and this had downstream impacts on the megafauna. And then there's sort of paleoecological factors that climate change, aridification, and subsequent environmental change may have played a role. Now, in Australia, there's a lot that we can learn about these megafauna um, before we start sort of testing these hypotheses. And that was really my aim, was to better understand sort of the ecology and the paleobiology of a lot of these megafauna um, before sort of testing hypotheses regarding megafaunal extinctions. So I set out to collaborate with Jude Field, Steve Rowe, and others on a site known as Cuddy Springs, which is located in southeastern Australia. Um, the reason I have this little icon of this target on, on his back is because I had no idea as a graduate student 
that this was the most controversial site in all of Australia at the time. Um, and so, you know, picking Cuddy Springs as a first site to work on in Australia um, basically entrenched me in the megafaunal debate to, to, at the very beginning. And I'll explain why that is. So why was Cuddy Springs so controversial? Well, Cuddy Springs at the time was the only site on mainland Australia that demonstrated that humans and megafauna lived to about 35, 36,000 years. Um, every other site, uh, there was some dating and there was some discussion and some dispute, but um, you know, some folks had proposed that all the megafauna had pretty much died out around 44, 45,000 years, that people had come in around 45,000 years ago and by, you know, say around 40,000 years, uh, that most of these megafauna were extinct. And that was sort of the, the reigning hypothesis of the time. Um, but Cuddy Springs, just by having, you know, radiocarbon dates that dated to around 35, 36,000 years, suggested that Blitzkrieg um, was not the case, right? Overturned the Blitzkrieg hypothesis. Um, and so they brought in really great people like Clive Truman to look at the rare earths. And so that can actually help us determine um, whether there's been any mixing between the different horizons. And in fact, it didn't look like there was. Um, and you have these sort of discrete pre-archaeological and then archaeological horizons. So there's time before things arrive. And then there is intact archaeological horizons. So what I was interested in doing is actually studying the megafauna from those different horizons. So we studied lots of things like a giant wombat, um, sort of a, a, a fairly large, but not giant wombat. These are wombat-like animals. So this is a diprotodon, and this is another wombat-like animal about the size of a rhino um, called Zygomaturus, the same as this one's bigger than Zygomaturus. And then we have these other kangaroos, um, uh, Stenurus, uh, Protemnodon, and Macropus, which is still around today. And this, I just want to point out, this is the uh, lower incisor of this diprotodon. So it would grow uh, here. And we were able to actually take little tiny cereal samples. Um, and this can actually help record relative seasonality at the time that this, the tissue is being laid down. So actually help record the climate and the environment and the diet of this animal um, throughout their life, which is really exciting. So to start off, we wanted to know what sort of climatic change was happening between these two different intervals in time. And um, previous work by Gavin Perdoe and others um, had actually really paved the way to using kangaroos as a, um, an indicator for relative humidity. And so what he found, and also Brett Murphy found in other papers, was that in low rainfall regions, where you have these sort of uh, orangish um, squares, have higher delta 18 values, higher oxygen isotope values. And in high rainfall regions, they tend to have lower values. So what we find at Cuddy Springs is sort of the pre-archaeological, all of our, our kangaroos kind of fall in this, this dry-ish area, um, but it becomes drier in the archaeological time. So we see evidence of aridification or the drying out between these two different regions. We looked at relative seasonality, so these little tiny cereal samples. And we don't see um, significant difference in relative seasonality, but we do see a fairly seasonal environment. Things are going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And this can be a combination of um, differences in precipitation or differences in temperature. And so there's different interactions. It's hard to kind of tease those apart. Um, but basically what we can say is there was change in the seasonality, um, but we do see a fairly sort of um, uh, seasonal cycles that are happening um, in, in some way. They can, could be precipitation driven or temperature driven or both. But there's a lot we didn't even know about the ecology of these animals. So um, much of the work was based on morphology and it was thought that this um, kangaroos to nurus was sort of an open country mixed feeder and this was in contrast to the forest browsing sort of protemnodon and in contrast to grazers which are around today, macropus. And so we just set out to test these hypotheses. And what we found was actually pretty interesting. Stenurus, we would have thought, would have been located over here, or maybe even over here. Um, and in fact, was actually consuming vegetation in the densest part of this site. 
um, in contrast to protemnidon, which was sort of um, a little bit more positive. Um, this did not surprise us, macropus um, eating um, uh, vegetation in more open areas, probably a significant amount of grass, um, that sort of was consistent with what we expected. We also looked through time, and while we can't say too much because we only have one sample here of Stenuris, we do see a decline in Protemnodon and also decline in Macropus um, between the pre-archaeological and the archaeological horizon. Okay, so what is everything else doing in the site? So this actually shows all of the different animals. This is everything from the pre-archaeological this is everything from the archaeological site, and you can see these little shadow drawings. So things like um, Diprotodon are eating a fair amount of sort of mixed C3, C4 resources. Um, Diprotodon or Zygomaturus is eating things a little bit more negative. Um, but you see that there's a fair amount of C4 resources being consumed at the pre-archaeological horizon. But we actually start to see a decline in the consumption of these resources at the time when humans and megafauna occurring. And this is really interesting because we tend to not see a decline in C4 resource consumption in other places in the world. So um, as I mentioned, a lot of my work early on was based in Florida. And in Florida, we see something totally different, right? So as you go from sort of a glacial site to an interglacial site in Florida, um, we actually see an increase in the amount of C4 consumption. So here we have me browsers in blue, a few grazers, just a few horses on the landscape. At the interglacial site, we still have a, a good amount of browsers. We have a lot of mixed feeders noted in red. And then we have lots of grazers. And these aren't just any grazers. These are horses. We have mammoths. We have gompotheres. These are big grazers. So we have lots of C4 resources on these landscapes during this particular interglacial period um, where you really see this expansion of C4 consumption. So this winning what we kind of thought would be the case um, in Australia. So there was additional evidence to show that our pattern um, was likely very real because this had happened before. Um, so this is a paper by um, Giff Miller and colleagues where they looked at um, eggshells of um, various large birds. So Jenny Ornis um, uh, was one of them and also looked at wombat teeth. And so here we've got our wombat teeth in green. All of these others are and just to orient you a little bit, everything sort of below here, um, all these lower graphs are prior to 50,000 years. So what you can do is you can kind of trace up. So before 50,000 years, a fair amount of C4 was consumed. After, after 45,000, a tiny bit. Um, here you can see a little bit more, um, more C4, less C4, more C4, less C4. So something very real is happening on the landscape. Now, I will say I disagree with the conclusions of these authors. They took these data, which I think are robust and, and, and well done, um, but they then interpreted it to mean that humans therefore set fires on these landscapes and therefore cause megafaunal extinctions. And I think um, instead what this demonstrates is that there was a very real change in the landscape that affected what these animals were actually eating. But we can't necessarily say whether it was aridification, whether it was humans um, at this point. Larissa, I just want to remind the audience to start sending in your questions and for you to start wrapping it up. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, we wanted to know what these C4 resources actually were. So we looked at the microware. Um, and as I mentioned, we can look at things like grazing kangaroos, more of these mixed feeding orange kangaroos here, purple browsers or these other browsers in brown. And what we find are all these blue and red values indicate a browsing signature. All of these here are consistent with browsing. These are all the fossils. And they look a lot more like these here and maybe some of the mixed feeders than they do any of the grazers. Um, so what does that mean? It means that diprotodons were probably eating things like saltbush. Um, they were actually eating um, C4 browse in some of their, as, as part of their diet. One thing we know about saltbush um, is that there were other things like the giant shirt-faced kangaroo. This is a paper that um, Blaine and I worked on. This is actually how I got started in microware is um, we really wanted to sort of test this idea. And I, and I said, I'm going to do microware. And he said, well, let's learn the new method. And we did. And this is kind of the start to it all. 
Um, but essentially, it also came from a tea time conversation with Gavin Prudhoe. We were sitting having tea at the Australian Museum, and he said, yeah, it's really weird. We have, um, you know, in, in arid regions or in, say, subtropical regions, you would expect gurus um, to eat some C4, some of the C4 grasses, but then in temperate regions, those kangaroos aren't eating C4, they're actually eating C3 here, this, these orange and yellow bars. But Brahmtan Goliath was always eating C4. And this suggested it wasn't actually tracking sort of grass, C3, C4 grass in different regions, it was actually eating something different. And the microware essentially showed that it was more similar to browsers uh, than to grazers. Um, and the auction isotopes also showed, so at one given site, you have the same site, kangaroos, and the giant short-faced kangaroo. And what you find is that the kangaroos have higher auction isotope values, so they're probably getting a lot of their water from plant material, but the giant short-faced kangaroo has lower auction isotope values. It has to drink additional water um, to compensate for the salt in the salt bush. And so this gave additional evidence that they were eating salt bush. So this what was is a really this? fun, yeah, this was a really fun paper to be involved in because it was one of the first examples to show that you're really limited in what you can say if you're only using one method and you need to use multiple methods. Absolutely. And it was interesting um, thinking of what the conclusions meant as well, uh, because, you know, it could, the, the overall conclusion is that these animals um, were more vulnerable to extinction. And what that extinction risk was is, you know, be a lot of things. It could be that um, those watering holes are fewer and far between. It could be that they're more likely to be predated on when at those watering holes. And that could be from anything as far as humans to crocodiles. Um, it can also be that these, you know, these watering holes are just harder to get to. Um, and so eating salt bush, um, is a difficult strategy when water is a limited resource on a landscape. And so as things got drier, you essentially had increased competition at Cuddy Springs for more similar resources. So a really important thing is that droughts kill today. Um, we know this, um, and they can have a profound impact on the environment. I'm gonna skip through this a little bit, but um, one of the main things I just wanna stress here is that at Cuddy Springs, we see clear evidence of increased aridification and a shift in diet away from C4 resources such as saltbush um, and the need to then sort of compete more for smaller resources. I don't think we can rule out climate as a potential driver of megafaunal extinctions. On the same note, our data do not speak to whether humans played a role. Um, and so we can't sort of get engaged in that debate um, because we just don't have those data. I will say that you know, why am I talking about a project I started as a graduate student? <laughs> it was published only about three years ago. Uh, it took us about 10 years between generating the data, took about five years, two years to settle on a manuscript, years to get through peer review. And even when it came out, so the, uh, about a month before our paper came out, this paper came out saying humans rather than climate cause the extinction. Ours came out saying, hey, we might wanna consider climate as a driver. And then that whole debate over Cuddy Springs, um, it having a target on, on its back sort of lessened because another paper came out showing that humans and megafauna on mainland Australia had coexisted to at least about 35, 36, 37,000 years. Um, and, and then another paper came out just shortly thereafter saying, and humans probably came over even earlier, maybe as early as 65,000 years old. So now we are seeing a very different picture. We're not seeing a picture of Blitzkrieg, humans coming over, killing megafauna in a short period of time. What we're seeing is a prolonged period of coexistence in Australia. And I won't talk about this right now, um, but we're currently also working on the marsupial lion. And essentially we see something very similar. Um, we think that increased aridification, reduction of trees, inability to hunt from trees, um, really was a driving force in the extinction of this pouch predator, um, the killer wombat. So climate change, including aridification, um, can have these profound sort of impacts. Um, on these Australian mammals in the past. And that's a really important thing need to consider moving forward. I have a quick little story I just can't help but share you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do as quick as possible. Um, 
quokkas are some of the cutest animals you've ever seen. If you don't know what a quokka is, you can Google it. There's a thing called quokka selfie. Um, and these folks have made it sort of a famous uh, kind of pastime and have increased tourism in Western Australia. Um, I'll tell you reasons why not to do the quokka selfie is you can get salmonella and, and all sorts of other parasites. So you want to avoid that selfie and maybe do a standard photograph. Um, but quokkas are really limited in um, their locations today. So quokkas are really only found uh, on this tiny island of Rottnest Island where they're um, present in large numbers, a little island called Bald Island here. And this is an accurate graph in the sense that it's showing um, their, their present distribution, but it doesn't show density. They're actually very rare. And, and, you know, if there were a thousand quokkas in this entire range, you know, that would be uh, impressive. We don't even know if there's that many um, in this area, but they're highly restricted and they're really only really uh, in high abundance on Rottnest Island. And so we were really interested in understanding why this was. Um, and this work was championed by um, an undergraduate in our lab, uh, Ellie Schultz. And we really wanted to know why were the range restricted? Was there any sort of environmental reason why these animals should not be sort of more prolific on the landscape other than the introduction to invasive species such as uh, foxes and, and, and feral cats and whatnot in these areas? Um, and so we looked at their microware and basically found that if you compared um, sort of mainland fossils to modern fossils on the mainland, there was no difference. Everything was sort of browsing. Um, if you compared island and modern animals today, that they are sort of obligate browsers. They, they browse. Um, that's what their microware sort of demonstrates. But when we looked at the isotopes, what we found was really interesting. Um, the isotopes from quokkas on islands was actually more positive than those on the mainland uh, today. But the fossils were even more positive than that. And what this tells us is it actually gives us a really different picture of their ecology. What it says is that fossil or um, quokkas in the past actually preserved or preferred more of like a mosaic ecosystem. And this is actually something that a lot of the, the, the indigenous, the Aboriginal um, members of the community understood. They would actually do sort of um, some sort of prescribed type burnings um, in a controlled way, open up the landscape. And they actually did hunt quokkas um, for a, a quite a period of time, but quokkas were not killed um, because of uh, the practices of the, of the Aboriginal individuals. Um, it was most likely the Europeans coming over uh, invasive species and also um, directly uh, hunting them as well, because they were actually uh, in high numbers up until the 1930s. But what the importance of this data is it actually shows that if we want to manage for quokka populations moving forward, their presence in this really sort of the densest part of the modern environments today is likely a function of them trying to avoid predation and avoid these foxes and is not their sort of normal ecology um, where they're found in more open areas. And so, you know, foxes are having these sort of devastating impacts on a lot of small mammals. And we've actually put together a children's book um, that uh, we'll be posting on our website soon. And uh, we're really excited about it. And it actually tells the story of uh, Quincy Quaka and her friends, and also um, the problems with the invasive foxes. Um, and just one last little point is that, you know, Australia is not new. Uh, they know about invasive species. Unfortunately, it's sort of the, um, you know, an ecosystem which we've learned what not to do, right? There are stories on cane toads and foxes, feral cats, rabbits, lots of things have been brought over to Australia and really wreaked havoc. Um, but these are things that we need to consider when thinking about climate change, fires, conservation in general, because it's not as simple as if it was just one of those, those factors. And this, uh, just a fun fact, um, and I didn't, this is actually from the National Wool Museum. Um, I, I didn't believe it, but I looked at, I, I did more research, looked online, looked at the math, and, and theoretically, if you have, you know, a pair of sheep in a paddock for three seasons, you'll produce five to six sheep, but you can produce up to 62,000 or more rabbits 
on that same area. Uh, obviously, there's things like carrying capacity that would play in, but that just shows you how quickly invasive species can get out of control. And the last point, which I think is really relevant to what's happening with COVID, is the one upside of all of the invasive species sort of um, catastrophes that have happened in Australia is they really have learned from it. They have learned that they are an island nation that evolved in isolation for many millions of years and they do well when you bring over non-native predators or non-native species. Um, so when you go throughout the airports or you even cross this natural border um, into South Australia, there are quarantine bins, there are there um, were beagles, they've actually retired the beagles and now have labs, but they're not really focused on, you know, drugs, they're focused on bananas. They want to make sure that pests, parasites, et cetera, are not getting in. Um, if you bring an animal in, they have to go through quarantine and they understand quarantine. And in a world of COVID, I just really want to point out that, um, you know, in Australia, their cases of quarantine, they have about 25 million people, so they have less than the U.S. by, by quite a bit. Their deaths as of yesterday were 837, um, which is an unfortunate number. But if we had the same death rate as was happening in Australia, we would have closer to about 10,923 deaths, not 197,000. And this is in due to a culture in which quarantine, again, is taken very seriously. And, and that little island, Rottnest Island, where all those quakas are in high prevalence, that was actually one of the quarantine locations um, where they would send people for 14 days uh, to quarantine when they came in from another country to make sure that coronavirus did not um, uh, wreak havoc in their populations. So well, that would be a nice place to be sent to with all those quakas. <laughs> oh, oh, I, yes. <laughs> I would have loved to be quarantined for 14 days on Rottnest Island. Um, and I, and from looking at the interviews of people who were quarantined, I think they did, they did enjoy it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, if we can uh, wrap it up, we've got lots of questions. Okay, sounds good. So this is uh, basically, I just wanted to say that invasive species have also had profound impacts. Um, we need to really think about this in managing sort of moving forward. And lastly, fossils are important. They provide us with these critical insights regarding the effects of climate change, but also the species before European arrival. Uh, with that, I just wanna thank um, all of the institutions, all the funding agencies for help with this work um, and leave it to any questions. All right, thank you, Larissa. <laughs> David, let's move right into the Facebook questions. Sure thing, we've got a few. Uh, I'm gonna start with one that was asked right before you partially answered it. So this is from uh, Aaron, who asked, uh, who asked if any isotope work had been done on the marsupial lion, which you did then address, um, but he also mentioned other predators. Has any of that work like that been done on other predators? Yes, so that's an area we are, um, we've done lots of isotope work on the marsupial lion, and we just finished this past uh, summer. Um, basically, we've looked at the marsupial lion from everywhere, from Tasmania to South Australia, up into Queensland to Western Australia, throughout their range as best as we possibly can with the fossils are available. Um, and we see the same story. They are reliant on forest browsers and forest browsers basically, um, you know, largely decline uh, in Australia with the opening up of the landscapes and aridification. So um, it tells a pretty compelling story um, and we hope to sort of get this story out soon. We have also looked at things like the thylacines and the Tasmanians um, and a lot of the fossils. And we're also looking at the microware, which is telling an interesting story as well. Um, we have a study going on looking at thylacine microware um, sort of throughout all of Australia and also on Tasmania, and then after European arrival in Tasmania. And there's, there's quite an interesting story there as well. So lots, uh, our big kind of stories uh, on Australia are all kind of in their final stages um, and required actually getting to every single state and territory um, before we could answer them. So um, we're really excited to, to, to share those in uh, the coming months to years. Very cool stuff. Here's a question from Anthony, who asks, have you found changes in the diets of some species during their lifetime? Yes. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. You can do it experimentally, um, where you can sort of 
folds and look at you know how their diets have changed. We can also look at isotopes um, on animals that have already died and look at how you know if if we're seeing sort of changes um, that are laid down over the course of their life. Um, what's really interesting is we've looked we worked with a modern ecologist um, on kangaroos in Australia, and what we've looked at is sort of healthy kangaroos. Um, that have sort of died under sort of uh, normal conditions, um, so no sort of droughts. And then we've looked at kangaroos that have died under pronounced drought events, and even within the same population. So they're not the same individuals, it's not throughout their life, but it's a short term, very quick, um, you know, after a drought happens, you then see this, this complete change in the diet of some of these animals. Um, so we are in things like microware able to actually pick up that drought signal. So with a really solid understanding of modern ecosystems, we can then go back in the fossil record and begin to test if sites like Lansfield were sort of a, a mass, mass death assemblage. Was it because of a, a large drought um, that sort of came into this area? And that's why a lot of these animals died. So yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Uh, another question, this is a, a broader impacts kind of question from another of our former ETSU friends, Ethan. Uh, Ethan asks, do you have any thoughts on the prospects for this kind of work in Madagascar? It seems like a similar question to Australia, v. aridification versus human activities contributing to megafaunal extinction. Yeah, so this can, these sorts of questions I really think can be asked in lots of different regions and these tools um, are widely applicable on, on many different continents. So um, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually what brought me to Australia was we were asking these questions in Florida, um, but in Florida, we really didn't see this dramatic change. We saw sort of it went from, you know, warm to warmer. And what, I, what really drove me to starting to look at Australia is I wanted to look at ecosystems that we knew were experiencing sort of profound climate change and what were the impacts? Were there tipping points at which you then had, you know, downstream impacts or, or you know, extinctions um, because of, of climate change? So absolutely, you could, I think the strength and the power of analysis is in, be, is in being able to apply it um, to very different ecosystems, very different mammals um, across the world. Exciting prospects. Uh, we just got another question that is a, a really intriguing question from Barbara who asks, can you tell what the giant birds ate since they don't have teeth? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, birds are a lot more challenging. Um, so the data that I showed from that other paper, they were actually using eggshells. Um, so you can look at eggshells, which are a tissue that is formed. Um, based on what an animal is eating and laid down. And so that can give you some insight. Um, you can also look at their bones. Um, now things like eggshells, uh, but bones more so, um, can be prone to what we call diagenesis or they can actually alter. So depending on how old the specimen is, you have to be careful when you look at things um, that are more porous like bones. But you can apply some of these similar tools like isotopes to bones. And we can't do microware. Um, which is a bummer, but um, we can look at isotopes. And, and a lot of work has been done with, with eggshells. The tricky thing with eggshells is what bird did it come from? So you really have to do a lot of work to figure out, you know, what, what the source is. And I'll ask one on here, the... David. Uh, sorry, I'll ask one here, David, uh, from Grant Boardman. He's wondering about how you know where to draw the thresholds on the C3, C4, mixed feeder diets. Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of that is based off of um, modern studies of C3, C4 um, plants and also studies of animals that eat those C3 and C4 plants. Um, it's really not super precise in the sense that we're, when we interpret diets, we're really looking at, or a lot of what I'm looking at is how an animal has changed over time or shifted their diet. Um, we sort of do have some end members, so somewhere around negative eight or negative nine in, in our carbon values. Um, if you're more negative than that, that indicates that you're eating a fair amount of C3 resources. If you're more positive than say 
you know, negative two or zero, um, then you're eating a fair number of C4 resources. And if you're eating things in between, um, you're probably eating some sort of mixture of the two different resources. So um, a lot of that, again, is based on modern samples, sampling of modern animals, um, and then sort of working backwards to interpret that. We also do account for the change in atmospheric CO2 uh, in the atmosphere when interpreting fossils that are from, from older sites. All right, now we are uh, at about one o'clock, but we also started a couple minutes late, so I'm gonna try to get through just a couple more of our Facebook questions. Uh, back on the subject of birds, Donna asks if you've examined any parrot species. I haven't. Um, I, as you saw in that one figure I pulled up, I, I don't turn away many mammals. If they're really small, I tend to not study them, um, but most other mammals we study, um, we haven't ventured into birds and probably won't, although we have ventured a little bit into a, a, a special reptile dinosaur project, which will be a fun adventure, but um, haven't looked at birds. Okay. Uh, you, 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 you said the, 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 the word dinosaur there, which I'm sure has perked up some ears, <laughs> but actually a completely different direction. We have a couple of questions about plants. Great. Greg asks, is the salt bush in Australia the same genus, Atroplex, as the salt bush here in the southwestern U.S.? Yes, we get, there is Atroplex in, um, uh, in Australia, and we actually, part of that Cuddy Springs paper that I didn't show was work by Dodson where he looked at the pollen um, from Cuddy Springs. And so we also do have pollen as a part of the picture um, and can look at sort of changes in pollen um, through time. And so what is really interesting is that you're getting a ridification and you're getting a movement away from eating salt bush, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the salt bush is not on the landscape. It may be even more prevalent. The animals are just not able to eat those resources with water. Um, very similar, if you were out you know, hiking for three days and ran out of water and you've got you know, a, a, a granola bar um, or, a, or let's say a candy bar versus a bag of Fritos, you're probably going to eat the, the item that's not going to cause you to get thirsty, right? Um, so anyways, it's very similarly, these, the, the plants may in fact, and in some cases look like they are on the landscape still and, and even more prevalent, um, but those animals are not eating uh, those resources as much. And speaking of uh, plant evidence, Grant asked, are there phytoliths uh, and or, or similar evidence to help characterize the flora? That's a great point. Um, I don't, I don't know that we have looked um, and there should be. I mean, uh, so that's, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that actually might lead into uh, this last question that I'll ask from our Facebook audience, uh, which is a great question to end on. Mason asks, what are the types of things you're looking to research in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a lot more to be done in Australia. There's a lot more that we've started that we're just, you know, trying to wrap up. Um, one of the things that we're working on are kangaroos, modern kangaroos throughout their entire distribution. So it's been a project that's taken many, many years to generate all of the data, but we are now able to understand what a particular kangaroo um, was doing a, like a modern species, a living one, um, at a particular interval of time with a particular climatic sort of conditions that it lived under. And that's really going to provide us with this sort of Rosetta Stone for really interpreting isotopes and microware moving forward. So um, we're actively working on that. We're actively looking at the carnivores. So the Thiacalia story um, and also the thylacine story are really interesting. Um, and we're also going further back in time and working with colleagues um, like Suhan, Mike Archer on uh, sites like Riversley to understand what things like Nimbodon, this, this tree climbing um, diprotodontid uh, was doing. You know, why was it this giant rhino size or not quite rhino size, but bear sized um, marsupial doing in the treetops? 
are looking at that as well. Um, I've also been really fortunate to get the opportunity to collaborate with folks in South Africa. Um, and so we're applying a lot of these tools and techniques to looking at um, the Cape floral biome in South Africa and sort of the impacts um, that potentially humans had um, to maintaining the sort of um, ecosystems uh, and what the impacts were on those herbivores and, and the carnivores in those systems. And we, we're just, you know, we love collaborating with folks um, where these tools can be of use. And we even, you know, there are archaeologists we work with all the time where we can apply um, some of these same tools to their questions. So we've got our questions, which are mainly focused on climate change and impacts of climate change and humans on megafauna or animals in historic time periods. Um, I will say we have ventured into coming back to the modern a little bit, right? So I have a student, we're, we're submitting a paper right now on polar bears um, and looking at polar bears from a thousand years ago and polar bears um, in the most recent time periods and even like just through the last century. And do we see a shift and in increase sort of carcass utilization in polar bears? Are they changing what they're eating? Are they able to change what they're eating? Um, and so a lot of these questions, uh, about the past, we can both use historical specimens, but we can also use a lot of fossils as well. So we're, we're kind of back in earth, not just using the modern as a baseline anymore, but actually using the modern to look at historical climate change uh, in addition. Great, well, thanks to everyone who asked uh, questions. This has been some really exciting discussion. Yes, thank thanks you, so Larissa. Much. Thank you so much for having me. And as always, if anyone's ever interested in reaching out, feel free to email me. I put our, our new website on, on, the, um, on the screen. And also we've recently joined Twitter and we, we <laughs> out new papers or fun things every now and then. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions um, and you can email me directly. And for students at ETSU, uh, we often do collaborate with Larissa. A number of students have worked with Larissa and worked in her lab. She's one of the few labs out there that actually designed to do both microware, this sort of new techniques in microware and isotopes in the paleoecology. So there's a lot of opportunities for students here in Tennessee to collaborate both at ETSU and Vanderbilt. And Larissa, I usually have lots of questions as, as we go through these talks, but uh, you answered them almost every time. Uh, right as I started to have those questions. So you were, you were really right on target. So thanks again for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.